Hello, and welcome back to season two of Office Hours Career Paths for PhDs. My name is Dr. Jasmine Goodman. I am the co-creator of this series along with my colleague, Dr. Marianne Kwakwa, and we are excited to ask all of the burning questions that you have about transitioning into careers in the industry, or even if you want to stay in academia, we'll be exploring some of those careers as well. I am excited to bring our guest today, Dr. Matthew Hale, which I believe we can give him the award for most PhDs at this point because this is our first dual PhD. He is a user experience design researcher at iRobot, and he holds dual PhDs from Indiana University, Bloomington. So give me one second as I bring him to the stage. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm going to take my watch off so I don't hit it against okay. the table, but I'm oh, good. No problem. So of course I have questions. Dual PhD. How do we get there? What's going on with that? I think you're the first person I've heard of it, but you're the first person I've actually had a conversation with about it. So kind of tell me how you took that that academic path. Yeah, so uh, I, Indiana University, they allow you to do a dual. I don't know if I've heard of anyone doing a triple. I'm from a very working class background. Had money not been an object, which would have been nice, mm -hmm. I would have done a triple. So part of my background was in folklore studies and anthropology, and I, did it in a department that was uh, formed by Dr. Richard Bauman and had like three different sort of departments smushed together. So it was very dis interdisciplinary to begin with. Um, I originally started in folklore studies at Indiana University. Um, the reason I decided to do a dual was for like financial career safety, like having a safety net. So in folklore studies, um, there is like there's a job that exists each year or maybe every two years a job exists. It usually coincides with, a, 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 this is morbid, but it's true. Uh, someone passes away or retires and then yeah. there's a job that exists. And then there are this many people who want to apply for that one job. And then almost never does it go to a person who just was a newly minted PhD. Um, so it goes to someone who's had more experience and has been waiting in that hopper, so to speak. So for me, I was thinking like, there aren't a whole lot of jobs in this, this one space. Um, and I had done an internship in museum studies uh, in sort of the museum space, and I liked it, but I, it, it, wasn't, it didn't exactly align with like what I envisioned me doing for the rest of my life. I liked it, but it, it didn't bring me a lot of joy. I just enjoyed it okay. And so I thought, well, I'll do a double. That will give me more opportunities to apply to more jobs. Um, if nothing else, I could just write dual PhD. Uh, there are a few friends that I have at IU who who did a similar thing, and I had I had, they were ahead of me in their degree path. So I you know like, I asked them essentially the question you just asked me like what how did you do that why did you do that, and it was mainly just to have like a couple of more opportunities when I hit the market. At the time, I only was thinking of doing academic jobs, um, mm -hmm. and then later in life, uh, I got I, I landed a tenure track job and decided I wanted to branch out of that space. And I'm a, I'm a lot happier now that I have, but I, in my mind, I was like, if I get double PhD, then I will be able to get a job and maybe like a sociology department or an anthropology department, or maybe a department that's kind of on the intersection of the psychology, something in, at the intersection of like humanities and social sciences, maybe. Um, but I ended up in communication studies, which is one of, one of them. So if I had not had the double and just had the communications degree, uh, maybe I wouldn't have needed to invest that much time in the second but uh, it was it was me just trying to protect myself. Right. And I think that's important, too, because often we pursue a career path or an academic path because we love the subject. We see the possibilities. We want to build the literature in that space. But we have to also be realistic about our job outcomes. And as you mentioned, many people, especially if you go into a field that is you know outside of STEM, you are really waiting for someone to retire or unfortunately pass away for you to have yep. a job. Now, what was your your process like when you graduated your program? What was your next step? Was it straight into the tenure track program or did you kind of meander your way through different paths? I, I would say um, I meandered the whole time, but I, en I ended up getting so like I had about six months before I had defended my dissertation. I applied to all of the jobs that existed that were vaguely relevant, as well as ones that were actually genuinely relevant. Almost all of them never contact, contact me back. Some of them contacted me. I did some interviews. Um, I still have nightmares where I wake up in like sweat of my very first job interview where I thought I, I read uh, Karen Kelsky's uh, blog and her book. I prepared for the interview in every single way a human could. And then they asked me a question 
and I got stumped on that. So I still have recurring dreams about that, but I did a bunch of interviews mm -hmm. and I ended up going to Austin P state university. I'm originally from like South central Kentucky. So not far from where I landed in, um, I don't know if it's, it's like 35, 45 minutes outside of Nashville. So okay. I was about an hour and a half from where I grew up. And I was like, okay, I, I didn't dream of ending up kind of close to where, you know, I was born and, and spent a large chunk of my life. But I got that job and then defended my dissertation in December. So I started in the summer. Um, I will say having, so working class background, I don't have any family support. Uh, I don't talk to and I'm not connected with my mother, my father, grandmother, anyone. So when I uh, applied for that job, I was as broke as a human being could be. I'd maxed out my credit card to be able to like m get into U-Haul. I packed up my entire apartment by myself, unloaded it into this Clarksville, Tennessee place. And it was really, 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 really stressful, particularly having to wait for 30 days or so before my first check arrived. Yeah. So I ate a lot of rice, didn't die, but barely. So I got in and it was really, really, really difficult. And I had a really hard time mentally being like, wow, I did it. One of people in my program, very few got a tenure track job. I achieved the dream. I did it. While also being like, I've eaten rice for seven meals for two weeks. And like, how is this dream I have accomplished? And this, I've eaten nothing but rice for like two weeks. Uh, how did those two things align? They didn't. So I did that job. My pay was, uh, I made 54 something uh 54 50, around $55,000 a year and that was the most anyone in my gene pool had ever made mm -hmm. and i was like i'm doing pretty good right and then i met my girlfriend who was in her office behind me and she works in software and tech and we started talking and the mental image she had of how much someone who's in this like highly being a professor, at least for me growing up, the idea, it was like, wow, what a yeah. lofty position. Surely yeah. you must make a fairly good amount of money. Yeah. Um, and 55 was great for me from where I was from, but she was like, oh my God, that's all you make. And you have this many degrees. She was nice about it, but it was like, right. you work, you work. I worked way more than 40 hours a week grading mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And so that inspired me and also made me sad, not, not her fault, but mm -hmm. I then applied to a new job and I got another tenure track job in Detroit and I moved up. We both moved up there and I liked it. I made $70,000, but I was also working probably 60 hours a week. Wow. Um, and I, I just couldn't get over the fact that I was putting so many hours into research, teaching prep, and then the universities that I was working for, the carrot that was dangled before me was eventually you do these things, you sacrifice for five or six years, we may keep you, and then you can move up, maybe you might get a 10 or 5% pay increase, and then you can work yourself to death for another five years, and if you ever make it to full, there's maybe another 10 or 15% pay increase. Yeah. So all of that academic job that I dreamed of, I got the positions, but I was very, very frustrated by, why do I want to stay at this one position for five or 10, 15 years, and only make a little tiny increase in salary. I loved the freedom it allotted, but it, it just didn't, I don't know. I wanted to make more money and to be able to like enjoy my life on weekends and take breaks and like be a person. Yeah. Um, that was a long winded way of saying I went straight into academia, but I was sad. <laughs> <laughs> but no, and thank you for being so transparent with that because I think that a lot of people that come from backgrounds where, you know, your parents, didn't go to college or you come from a lower income status, you tend to overcorrect in your own professional and educational decisions because you want to make sure that you are able to live a better life. Well, mm -hmm. you got the education, you made more money than the people, as you mentioned in your gene pool, but there's still that quality of life piece that just wasn't there. And I think it's important to own the past influences that have got you to where you are today but give yourself permission to pursue something else because just because you're doing better than other people have done, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right position or the right life for you in that moment. Now, mm -hmm. tell me what were conversations like with your peers in academia at the time when you were, you know, just kind of wrestling with 
wanting to do, to do more, wanting to earn more and not wanting to have your entire life in academia? Yeah, um, I didn't have a ton of conversations, not like verbalized conversations. It was mostly via social media with a few friends. A few of the people I was friends with in the different departments, the two departments I was in, a few of them had found careers outside of academia. And so I touched base with them and they seemed um, happier. The problem that I had, and I didn't consult with people as much as books, was that um, I had a really hard time. I had built my identity of, I'm gonna get a degree, get another degree, get another degree, become a professor. And my identity was my job. Yeah. So like they were completely and utterly tethered together. And so my, the hardest thing for me was trying to figure out how do I decouple my identity from my work? That was the main thing. Like, I don't want to be my job. And in my current role, I am a person who has a job. I like doing my job. I'm passionate about it, but it isn't me. It is my job. Those two are very separated. So the conversations I had, I would say were mostly had with my, my partner, she and I just talked frequently about like how she perceived her relationship to her work, which was like, she is here and she does work. And then I would constantly reflect on how my identity was this and my work was this. And they, there was no light between the two. Um, so most of it was talking to her. And then once I kind of read a few books um, and processed through it, um, I don't know, it, it became exciting and less terrifying of, of, of like a next series of moves. At first I was like, how could I, like, I don't even know what to think of myself. Cause I remember I would introduce myself as like, hi, I'm Matt, I'm a grad student or I'm a PhD student. And then later like, hi, I'm a professor of law. And people would usually be like, oh, that's cool. That's neat. Cool. That's, that's neat. I, I had a really hard time being like, well, what am I going to tell people about myself? Or like, what will I talk to them about it? Like social gatherings or, well, people care. Turns out no one cares. Like it's, it's just your job. I was way too self-focused in that respect. And I think it's because through all of my graduate career, you're kind of, um, there are blinders on both sides of you and you are the, the, it's a very straight path. You get degrees, you become professor. And if you do that, you successful, you are good. If you don't do that, you are bad and you should feel sad. And there's no reason it should be that way, but that's the pipeline I was on. And for me, it was just about decoupling those things and like getting an outsider's perspective, mostly from Victoria. And I think decoupling is a nice way to say it. You almost have to like rip it apart and break it down and just yep. divorce yourself of that because it it's a lot when you have built your entire identity around this idea, this dream that you've been sold and I don't know. I think that I would say institutions are still selling the dream, but there are a lot of other factors that go into the play where you're saying, okay, if I do this, I'm going to be this person. And this is how I'm going to show up in the world. And then you have moments where you have an identity crisis. Now, what was the moment where you decided, you know what, I'm done. And you took the leap into an industry role. What did that look like for you? Yeah, there was like a gradual, uh, chilling effect over time, mostly through uh, COVID. I reinvigorated my passion with teaching. I've always loved teaching more than research. COVID actually was a big opportunity for me. I used it to create content. So that was good. I became more attached to the discipline. Then I got this new job and I was in Detroit. And as part of that content production, I got a grant and we were making, um, I was building a lab. So okay. all of our spring break, I worked all of it unpaid. I drove an hour from my home in Ann Arbor to Detroit. Um, and I would work about 10 hours a day building a lab. I painted walls. I took a definitely impregnated with asbestos tiles off of walls. I did all this like super hard labor, um, spent it three or $400 of my money, put so much time into this. And then I got sort of a senior administrator came in and like really belittled me and made me feel bad for like doing the thing I was doing, even though I had checked through various uh, sources and made sure doing that thing was fine. And I remember just thinking like, wow, I have sacrificed my entire spring break in which I really needed a mental health break. I really needed like just a physical break. I had commuted a bunch. I just needed to do nothing and play video games or eat a sleeve of Oreos or just do something like you do go to the gym or something. Um, and instead I worked through the entire thing and then I got sort of chewed out and when I, when I drove home, I was, I was really thinking about it a lot. And as soon as I got home, I was like, screw it. Got on LinkedIn, 
set up an account. And then I, I read a ton of books that week and for the remainder of that week. And I applied to a ton of jobs. I still made, I had to make a video about, I didn't have to, but I chose to make a video about the process of building that studio and I uploaded it. And in all of the content that I produced, I was very positive. Like, look at this cool studio we've made for our university. I'm excited for my students. All that's true. But I left out the part where I was like, made to feel bad about uh, working extra hard, unpaid. My poor students could tell like when they came back from spring break, uh, I always, I get everywhere early. So I'd get early, get there early and students would be there early. And they could just tell that I was like kind of emotionally defeated and they asked and I talked about it and they were upset and I was upset. And it was, it was that defining moment was like, uh, you know, it's a job. I get paid X amount of money for my time and my skills and my services. Um, people can treat me poorly if they want to. And I have decided I, it's not something I'm willing to put up with anymore. So I'm going to look for other opportunities. Um, and I, about 30 or 40 days, the market's very different now in the, the space I'm in now because of various layoffs and everything. But I think it took me about 30 or 40 days. I, I had a couple of, uh, I had several interviews. I had a couple of job offers and I remember like going through that process and um, the, the, the various companies kept apologizing to me. Like, I'm so sorry, this interview process. I know we've had you do two calls for about 30 minutes and it's so long and grueling. And all I could think of like my, all of my tenure track uh, interviews was like, I got driven up to like a best Western with like no parking lot and like an abandoned car in the front lot that exploded. And they were like, here's where you're gonna spend the night. And we're going to have you interview for seven days. And one of them, you have to arm wrestle the Dean. And it's, you know, it's like really intense. Yeah. And yeah, they were very nice about it. And then I got on the phone and they told me how much they were going to pay me as a starting salary. And I was like, wow, this is very different than the other world I had been a part of. Um, so that was the moment. And then going through that process and getting an offer, I was like, why didn't I do this sooner? Why, why hadn't someone talked to me like, Right. You know, you can make more money than you're making now and also have a life and you could do things on Saturdays. Now, you mentioned books. What books were you reading at this time that really helped you to understand and process what was happening? They're all behind me. Uh, articulating design decisions. The first one, I can't remember them. I'm, I'm also like super nearsighted. Um, okay. I want a UX job was the first one I read. The event in which uh, that like inflection point where the person was rude to me. And I was like, I don't think I like this anymore. I bought that book and I was getting a frog tattoo uh, <laughs> on my left leg. And I read the book while I was getting a tattoo. Um, I'm a weird person who likes to read at the gym and I like to read while getting tattoos and other things. So I was just reading this book and I was talking to the artist, Nicole, who was lovely. And she and I were having a nice conversation and she talked about her moment of changing careers. And we had this nice discussion. Talking to Nicole was actually a huge moment for me. But that book set me on the pathway of like, I think UX is the the career for me. There's another book that I cannot remember the name of the title that uh, I think it's Leaving Academia, I think, or Leaving Higher Ed. That book was mostly, that was the book I leaned on for like thinking, reimagining my identity. The I want a UX job was the one that was like, okay, if I'm reimagining my identity uh, and decoupling it from that original, my job is who I am the I want a UX job was kind of exciting me about the next few steps, which was like, there are a bunch of jobs that exist and here's this field you could land in. There are different kinds of roles you could have. And when I would go on like LinkedIn and look at jobs, it freaked me out to see there are like 3000 roles that are open entry level and above. And when I would go on to higher ed jobs, I would see there are two jobs and they are both in. Uh, I'm going to pick a state in the middle of the country. Sorry, middle of the country, Iowa. And like, I don't, I don't have anyone who lives in Iowa. I don't want to move to Iowa. I'm not passionate about Iowa. So those books were the two primary ones that helped me, but there's, there was a whole bunch. Now, how did you land on UX as a possible opportunity for you? Because for a lot of people, I think, and I always say this, UX has academia in a chokehold right now where it everyone does. is just flocking to UX, but what, was it that prompted you to pursue that particular path? Yeah, most of it was the influence from my partner because she worked in sort of the tech space. 
she and I were constantly talking about it. I have always from very young, I've been very obsessed with technology and, and was quite passionate about how it could um, shape everyday life or impact everyday life. So it was just a personal interest talking with my partner made me kind of excited about it. In hindsight, I wish I had approached the non-academic job market much more broadly than just, just UX. There are so many roles that could leverage existing experiences, research or otherwise, um, like it could look just in tech, like project management. That wasn't a thing that was even on my radar, had no idea that that was a thing. All I knew specifically from that one book, I want a UX job was I could be a UX designer. I could be like a researcher. I could eventually go towards individual contributor and do the research, or I could go more towards managing people. And all of that felt like a natural jumping off point from what I had been doing. But there are so many roles that I didn't see as an immediate next step. And I wish I, in hindsight, I wish I had. I'm happy where I landed. I'm happy in the field that I'm in. But I 100% agree with you. I think there are a lot of business organizations, institutions, or people, or all of those, that are also selling the dream, just like academia is selling the dream of, if you do this, you can become professor. And that is the the story is you get this degree, you become a professor, life is great for you, you have elbow patches and tweed, um, happy. The UX thing is you do this boot camp for only this much money, and then you're going to quadruple your salary. And, you know, person as a graduate student making like $8 a year, I think my salary as a grad student was like $15,000 a year that they took $1,000 immediately for fees. Going from that, being told if you invest about that much money in a boot camp, you can then be on the other end of the boot camp, immediately get a job, and you'll make $150,000. I feel like it's a very similar parallel of dangling a dream in front of someone. Do this, give us your money, give us your time, and we'll get you a job. But I wish I had thought more broadly of just not UX. Again, happy I'm here, but with the market being as it is, I think it's really important to point out that it's, uh, these are individuals, businesses, institutions, et cetera, that are making a profit. And so like their goal is to sell you on a product and you are buying their boot camp or you're buying their books or whatever. It could be good. It could be great for you, but it's also important to know, like you don't want to jump from one dream selling to another. To another dream selling right. schema without thinking about it really critically and, and seeing, you know, what is in it for you and what are they gaining? Right. And I think it's also important, too, that there's the UX conversation or the UX jobs, but then there's also people that are just only pursuing opportunities in tech when there are so many other, you know, we've had people on this series that worked in government. You know, there's just many different ways in, in nonprofit work. So the goal is for us to allow people to explore all the different career paths, because also even what's happening right now with tech, they're laying everybody off. And so it's yep. something that you want to be mindful of that with those increased, you know, salaries and benefits there's also increased risk for not being in that position so how do you navigate that or at least be aware of the circumstance or the industry before you get into it now how are you able to translate your academic work into a resume or portfolio that a hiring manager would understand or even respect since you're coming from academia That was really hard. That was actually, I think, the biggest challenge, like reimagining myself for myself. Mm -hmm. That was hard. Being able to speak to people about something that's part of what being a graduate student or an undergraduate or professor is. You you talk about what you do and try to make it palatable and, and legible. The resume thing was hard because for the last X amount of years, I had done nothing except live to add lines to my CV. And it became, you know, however many pages it was, it became really long. Um, I applied for endless awards. And then when I got uh, on like building a resume, people don't care about the specific awards I got. They don't care about the specific publications necessarily I got. So it was mostly iterative. I made, um, I kind of did A-B testing with my resume. I would make one or two different versions of my resume, one that felt a little bit more academic, one that felt a little less so. And then I would apply to jobs with both of those and see what would become of those two. And then I would kind of just endlessly choose the better option until eventually I got to a better one. Um, and then I did, once I like got a job in tech and I was making enough money that I could actually save some money in my life and not like, like I had some financial stability. Um, 
versus being a graduate student. I saved some money and I was like, I must spend a couple hundred bucks to have someone review my resume and like make sure it's working okay. I also played with AI to rewrite things in my resume to see if it would uh, stand up to those like ATS systems because a lot of the job hiring process is now automated itself too. So yeah. most of it was like failing upwards, you know, just like screwing up a whole bunch until you make enough choices, just like machine learning. Like you make a bunch of incorrect choices, you have uh, undesired effects, and then you just kind of go up the branch that succeeds until you actually get to what you wanted to accomplish. And you're like, all right, something about the current resume is good. Mm, I'll use that as the jumping off point for the next iteration of, you know, resume 2.0 will be better than resume 1.0 that got me a job. How did you frame your experience? So let's say you have a publication or even your mm -hmm. dissertation. Mm -hmm. What would that look like on an industry resume? That was tricky. I think most of it for me was about um, translate, talking more about methods and less so about the specific thing that I was researching because mm -hmm. that was more legible. It was like the lingua franca was uh, you did ethnography, you did in-depth interviews, you did, so like in saying, instead of saying I did in-depth interviews with all of my uh, uh, participants in my study, which I did, I just kind of described them more so as a user interview because that that is essentially what it was. I did a lot of what was called contextual inquiry, but in my line of uh, academic training, we didn't use that language to describe what I was doing. I was just doing observation, participant observation and ethnography. So I was just trying to find the translation from one community's language to describe what they uh, desired and respected and like would use as tools to what my earlier career was trained, training me to do and what I decided to do in my dissertation uh, research. So it was m more than anything, it was about going like, what do they care about and how can I tell them in a way that's uh, like legible? Um, the other thing that was, I think, more important than just translating it into the resume was building a really good like portfolio uh, deck so that when I presented my academic research, it didn't sound like the, it was nothing like what I would have done in an academic conference, which I would have talked about and kind of gone into real detail about like, how does this link up with Michel Foucault and how can I talk mm -hmm. about Derrida and how can I, I'm a huge fan of Bakhtin and uh, Mikhail Bakhtin. And I was like, oh, I can just talk about Bakhtin for 15 minutes and people will also nerd out about Mikhail Bakhtin with me. Well, none of that's relevant. Instead, I would try to frame it as what did I do? Uh, what methods did I use? What were the like deliverables? Mm -hmm. So framing what I accomplished in academia to deliverables was trying to reimagine it as that. It's not that hard in hindsight, but at the time it was really, really difficult. Like, what is a deliverable? I remember like, you know how, uh, if, I, if you're similar to me, you'll get in the shower and you'll just like be existential in the shower and just be like, why do we exist? Um, <laughs> while you're looking at your shampoo or like the spider in the corner of that. And I was just like, what even is a deliverable? What, right. what is it? Yeah. How do I, have I have one? Do I have one? So it was, it, a lot of it was like, not that hard after the fact. I ended up with a product that was easy to understand, but yeah. thinking through of it, jumping out of academia and thinking of it in a different light was, was challenging in, in that time. Yeah. One thing that I've noticed, and so I've been out of academia for, well, out of, I graduated three years ago, so I'm still mm -hmm. kind of attached to it, but I'm also consulting. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I've noticed that I've been able to do is take all of my, my academic research and reframe it as problem, approach, yep outcome. Yep. What was the problem? Because a lot of time with business, well, all the time with businesses, they have a business problem, which is why they're wanting to conduct this research. Yep. Second being, what's the approach? What method did you use? You know, what, what else was involved in that? And then what was your outcome, whether it's a deliverable or, you know, they were able to inform, you know, a decision, but the goal is just because you have the academic publications, you can still use that in your CV. But of course you want to be honest about, you don't want to frame it like, oh, I did this client work. If it's a, if it's a publication, you can say that. But yeah. what's most important is that you still understand the process. So problem, mm -hmm. approach, and then outcome. Now, tell me about landing the first job. What was it like? Um, I want to get all into the, the nitty gritty of mm -hmm. a day in the life. Yeah. So landing the first job was, uh, man, it was weird. Now in hindsight, now, having done this for going on a year, 
feels normal. At the time, I had a really hard time. So uh, the job, I, I work at iRobot. It's a consumer robotics company. I've enjoyed my time there a lot. I, I love all the people I work with and the work that we do. But like they sent me a laptop. Just in, They were just like, you need a laptop. I owned a laptop, but they were like, here's a work laptop. And they were like, what kind do you want? And, and I remember just thinking, what? <laughs> like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, because when at various institutions, not to be too specific to call people out, but or institutions out, but like I arrived there at different institutions and I met some of my colleagues and they had like a 19, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, like not a 1998 laptop, but probably early 2000s. This was like in the 2020s. And they were like, this is the laptop they gave me. I tried to open SQL on it. It nearly exploded and it's this wow. big. So like getting that was a, a, a trip. The idea of like, your paycheck will be on this date and like real transparency about here's when you're going to be paid as opposed to good luck surviving for 30 days, stupid, like yeah. hope you live is yeah. the, the transitional moment of academia. Um, other than that, I don't know. It was just, it was really nice not having to commute. That was like one of the, I commuted all for my undergraduate. Uh, I commuted some through my master's. I commuted a little tiny bit, mostly walking, thankfully, for my PhD. And then for various jobs at post PhD, I commuted. And then suddenly I started to work and I could just, my commute was, I would get up, I'd take a shower and I'd walk to my laptop and I'd start working. I was so much more productive because I, I'm a, I love, I'm a workaholic. I love working. So I just ate lunch while working instead of taking a lunch break. I, I should take lunch breaks, but I just like, I didn't waste time commuting. I didn't waste time doing all this stuff that eats away at sort of your energy. So like those first few weeks on the job, um, it was, it was kind of wild. It was, a, it, it wasn't like, not everything's perfect. No job is perfect. No uh, corporation or industry or anything, nothing's perfect, but going from what I had been in to what I was current and what I am currently in, um, it was like a big culture shock. Uh, of talking to people and being like, wait, you, you have a gym at the office. And when you travel to do research, they pay for it instead of me having to pay for it. And then them being like, in seven months, we will give you money back. Like what? Yeah. So like that, that was really hard doing the work. It was just, you know, learn the language, learn the acronyms, lots of acronyms in tech. Um, figure out who you work with, do one-on-one -on -one meetings with people. That was all fine. Mm -hmm. My career in academia had made it okay to like, that was transitional or uh, uh, transposable skills. But yeah, just like the culture shock thing was, was a positive, but it was sort of shocking. Tell me about your day-to-day -day responsibilities in your role. So we talked about shower, get in front of the computer, mm -hmm. You get to work. What types of, at a very high level of course, what types of yeah. activities are you involved with on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. So my day, my day-to-day -day will typically vary depending on if we have a current uh, research project. We will usually have several different research projects. So you'll work on one as maybe the lead, or two as the lead, or you might support one and work on the lead as another. But you're usually juggling a few different balls, and so that means that my week in November, my my November may feel very very different than May because I might be running a diary study. Uh, and if I'm doing an international diary study, then I have to align with whatever uh, time zone that might be in. Or I might have to figure out some logistics, like, okay, I'm going to be traveling to this place and that place. So for one or uh, two months of the year, I might be traveling a lot. Other days, um, very frequently, it's just like I get up and I go to a couple of meetings. I'll figure out like my to-do list for the day. Most of my day is spent... Um, a lot of it is like, who are the people, uh, who are my stakeholders that I need to help figure out they have some problem? How do I help them ask the right questions or figure out what questions they want answered? Then I will spend time with my teammates or by myself. What methods, what tools do I need to do to answer those questions and to make them as useful as possible? And then eventually I'll do that research and then I'll, I'll make recommendations or do presentations and readouts. Um, but most of the time it's like, you know, get up, communicate with people, figure out what they need, how can I support them and answer their questions, and then doing research. A lot of the time, my favorite thing is just looking at like a spreadsheet. 
I'm not a quantitative researcher. That's one thing I, I should say. I'm a mixed methods researcher with way more emphasis on qualitative analysis. Mm -hmm. And I have found this is a thing that I've been able to grow in new directions that I couldn't in my old job um, and old life essentially is I have found that I really have, have found um, like there's something pleasurable to me about like doing quantitative analysis and like building surveys and looking at these large populations and doing stuff like that. That wasn't a part of my, uh, that wasn't the tools that I needed to answer the questions I was asking as a, as a PhD student. I'm finding that I'm allowing myself to grow in new ways. So that is also changing the tra trajectory of my day to day is I'm trying to like grow in new directions. And then anytime there's an opportunity to learn or do something, I try to take it. So it, I'm continuously having, um, I'm, I'm trying to absorb new skills, try new things. And so if you had asked me this question in my first few months at iRobot, it would have looked, the answer would have looked similar in the sense that my day-to-day -day changes depending on what research project I'm doing. But I would imagine in a few months from now, I might be doing something I never would have envisioned because I'm trying new stuff. So my day-to-day -day changes a lot, but almost always I'm doing analysis. I'm planning some research or conducting some research and talking to stakeholders to find out uh, what it is they need or want. Now, you mentioned a diary study. That's not something that we, that's not a term that we use in academia. Tell oh. the audience more about what a diary study looks like and what are some situations when you would use it. Yeah. And, and one of the things that was being able to use, there's a bunch of different platforms and tools, digital tools or platforms or organizations that are available to you that as a grad student, I didn't have access to them because um, I was able to get a Wintergren uh, dissertation field work. It's got a long title for anthropology. That was great. I got a lump sum of money, more money than I ever had ever seen in my life from my background. And I was like, wow, that's great. But I could only afford to live on that money as mm -hmm. opposed to like spend 10 or 15 or 20 or however much on these like platforms. So one part of it is um, the general method of like getting people to use a product or technology in their homes in a kind of naturalistic setting over a period of time and having them either write in a diary, physical, it could be like a literal notebook, or they could be doing something in a platform like Optimal Workshop or DScout or some, some one of these technologies. Um, and then you'll kind of analyze that naturalistic in home or in whatever context use with a product or series of products or services. And then you get a, a sense of what is it like, it's very different from like a focus group where you're bringing people into an artificial environment and saying like, what are your thoughts about this? Or here's this thing we might do, what do you think? Instead, you're like, here is a product or a prototype or here's whatever um, for whatever company or whatever product or service you're working on, you know, use it. What, you know, over five weeks of using this, 10 weeks or a month, of, you know, however much, what did you learn about the product? It's, it's very different data that you get from having someone spend time with something for months rather than, hey, it looks cool. I like the look of it, you know, in a focus group. Um, I think that answered the question, but diary studies are a thing I had not really done before. And um, like getting to do that was really, really, really fun. And um, anytime I get to do uh, diary studies or ethnography or anything like that, where I get to kind of play with the squishier data, qualitative mm -hmm. data, um, it feels comfortable, but I'm getting to do it in new ways. Right. Um, just like playing with quantitative data is more rigid, but also new and exciting. That's one thing I will say when I learned of all these different platforms, like I've heard of D-Scout, Recollective. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's one called Ethos. I'm like, wait, I can there's a thing where I can I can create a project, send it out to people and they participate. They engage that to me. And I've even I've, I forget one. Um, but one key that you can learn for our audience is that we'll put a list of the different platforms. They will do free demos to show you how yeah. to use the software so if or the platform. So if you're wanting to kind of get a feel for what industry methods can look like, then that list is gonna be perfect for you. But even from a project management standpoint, just all of this information that I had no clue with, cause I was managing everything in uh, Google Sheets, I'll be honest. Like yeah. I didn't have any type that was, it was very low tech, but there are so many ways that you can learn about how to do the methods, just even from the platforms. But my next question for you, tell me what your the experience has been like getting into analysis. So there's dissertation academic analysis, and then there is industry analysis. What does that process look like? And let's talk about, you know, even timelines associated with the analysis. 
Yeah, so timeline for my academic research was very, very slow by industry standards. Mm -hmm. um, I did my dissertation field work in one year, and then I wrote the dissertation in one year, and I produced a big dissertation. Um, now in my current role, the, the main difference, which I really, really appreciate, is it's not isolated. There's not this like romantic, isolated author concept. It's like we want the deliverable. We want it to be good. We want it to be legible and useful. So you're not producing a huge dissertation that no one would read in terms of it's like 800 pages, 500 pages. No one has time to read that in their work schedule. They need their results fairly quickly. And turnaround time could be as short as like a one day turnaround. We need you to do a thing, usability test uh, with someone on this thing. And we need the results by tomorrow. And so you need the results by tomorrow means that I can't make a, a really complicated presentation. I can make like a top line report or I could write out some bullet points or I could send out an email or I could do something like that. So whatever amount of time that you have and whatever resources you have, you'll produce different kinds of end results. Um, but the, the best thing for me is that it's not isolated. You will frequently be able to talk with and collaborate with folks. Not that academia doesn't allow you to collaborate, but there is so much more of a like, you might collaborate with a, um, a more senior scholar. You might be the more senior scholar. You might work with other teammates uh, in some respect. I don't think we would have called ourselves teammates, like co-authors or something. But in my current role, I feel very comfortable to just ask someone like, I don't know anything about this, or I'm uncertain about this, or I think this, what do you think? And it becomes dialogic and it's, uh, there comes Bakhtin. It, it becomes a dialogue as opposed to, at least for me in academia, from my background, I both felt this sometimes and I talked to other folks and they felt this too. You have to like, you might feel concerned feeling vulnerable and being in a graduate seminar and feeling like, oh, I so I'll back up and this will make sense. In the one department I was in, we had rhetoricians, film study, media studies scholars, and performance and ethnography people. I fit in that last slot. Mm -hmm. So I would be talking with people who had expertise in rhetoric. I knew of Aristotle and read some of the stuff that uh, he had written. I knew some of his ideas, but I didn't know it really deeply or Hegel or whomever. And so it was very alienated and made me feel stupid when I would be in a room with these people from a whole bunch of different uh, backgrounds, uh, like academic backgrounds, and they would talk about these things. And I would just write it down in the corner and be like, all right, well, I guess I got to read everything Aristotle's ever done. And then I would do that on my own. And then I would come and feel more prepared. In my current role, if I don't know something, maybe someone's talking about like a new technology that they are very familiar with because of their experience or uh, research background or whatever. Um, I just, I just ask. And I don't feel like they're going to be like, you big idiot, why don't you know everything about continental philosophy and all this, this technology? It's, right. I don't know, there's less posturing. There's still posturing. I mean, if you've ever been on LinkedIn, there's lots of posturing. <laughs> but there's, I don't know, it's just like, it's a work environment. Um, I think it's a lot of it's because you've decoupled yourself from the job. So your job and your identity are separate. So if mm -hmm. I, as a graduate student, didn't know everything that some other person over there knew about Aristotle, it was a fault of my character or my lack of preparation. It was like, oh, how dare you not know this? They know this. But in my current job, it's like, well, it's a role you do. You may mm -hmm. or may not have that experience. Someone else might. All we need to do is solve this problem. So like, get it done. Talk with other people, get it done. Um, so, yeah. And even with you saying that, I think it's important to know that within, if you are working on an academic paper, you kind of own what you're working on. Whereas with industry work, you don't own it. So you can really remove your emotions from it. So if someone else yeah. has a point that is different from yours, that's fine because it's not a result of you not knowing how to do the work. It's more so that let's say if you have a team of five people, you might have someone from business development product. They have all these different background experiences, but also they have a different lens that they they're working with that project from. So when you're getting feedback, it's not meant to attack your credibility or, you know, all these other things. It's really just to make the product or the outcome or the deliverable the best it can be for that client. And yep. it's like you, you said, we have to decouple ourselves from that because my first industry role, I wrote a sentence and someone came behind me and changed it. And I was just like, but it was, it was yeah. <laughs> like, what do you mean? But it had nothing to do with me, but they understood what that client, they understood the what I was saying, but that client would have received it the way that they wrote it. 
And yep. that was most important. So I had to learn that because I was like, I really like, you know, we, I'm a comms yeah. PhD, so we like our words, the way syntax is important, but it's something that I realized that it's really not about what I think is going to be the perfect way to say it or the perfect way to do it. There's so many other factors there. Yeah. Now I had, I had a similar experience to you where like you would generate a thing, whatever, like a graphic or, or text or something. And then someone would come back because it was a shared document and they would change cool. it. And I remember being like, oh, no, how could you, how could you do that? That was the, the clause. No, not the clause. But yeah, the more you get used to the document being an open thing and other people are contributing and changing it, you realize that it's fine. Like it, it's not a reflection on you. It's just about moving the, the ball towards the end goal. But I remember having that knee jerk reaction of like, oh, no, like, how could you? I, like I really put so much thought <laughs> into this, but you know, it's something that happens. And I even had to get used to uh, once we're working a document or we're, we're working on a project and the client will jump in and they have all these different things and they're moving things around. You're like, this is not how this method works. And it's like, well, yep. that's one thing I've learned in terms of working with methods on industry projects. It's very fluid. So you almost it have is. to have like your own um, process in place to make sure that the the level of rigor that you need is still there. Yep. But it's, it's much more fluid where we're not pulling up, you know, this article saying here's a step by step process because there are so many other factors. So learning to deal with feedback from clients and they're wanting to add in all these other things that aren't necessarily going to get them what they want and just managing all of that. I've learned to just divorce myself. I have no feelings. I yep. put it out there. Let me know what you think. I can update it based on your feedback. And if and when appropriate, I can push back, but mm -hmm. it's really just about being collaborative across the board and not internalizing any feedback. If they don't like that sentence, they're not saying that they don't like you or they don't yeah. like your smarts is, is something different. And I think it's really hard for academics up front. And then once you kind of get through that weird transitional moment, you're like, oh, this is fine, whatever. But yeah. that first few times, it's it it feels exactly like uh, being a grad student, you go to your first conference, and then there's a person mm -hmm. who has not so much a question as a comment, who then you know says, the thing that you just said, everything about it, I hate. And here's, yeah. uh, I'm in a monologue for about 15 minutes about how it sucks. And then you just have to like deal with it. And it really hurts because it's like, wow, this is a very personal attack, Greg. No one ever yeah. did this to be named Greg. But it's like, why? But yeah, once you get through that growing pain, um, it's fine. And I actually think it's a lot healthier. At least for me, it is a lot healthier. It's like, it's a document. I'm not the document. Do whatever yeah. you want with it. I don't care. On Friday at 5 p.m., I am going to go play a video game. And I'm not going to think about that thing anymore. Yeah, and I think it's... <laughs> We feel as though, at least for me, I have my anxiety can be high often. Like I remember the week of my defense and I've shared this before. I woke up with my heart beating out of my chest every single morning. And my first time having to present something to a client, I felt like I was going up against a firing squad. It mm -hmm. had, and it was just because I was coming from dissertation defense, being on guard, senior scholars who, you know, their goal when they go to conferences to try, you know, to really try and deflate you. So I, I had that perspective. Now, mind you, I've had amazing experiences of support and guidance in academia, but we've either, if you haven't experienced it yourself, you've heard of someone that has had that moment where a yep. senior scholar was, you know, flexing and it really just, that's not something that I've ever had happen in an industry role because mm -hmm. they're not there they're there to satisfy the client to, you know, fulfill the obligations of the project and then move on to the next. It's yep. not about inflating their ego so they they're they can posture around the office yep. or on the project. Yeah, my some of the first readouts that I did, um, even before this job of like developing things to do for for interviews, I also went in with like, oh, my God, this is going to be like dissertation defense gauntlet kind of. Um, it's antagonistic and they want to not like me or the thing that mm -hmm. I'm arguing about. It's like, no, uh, it's not that important to them. They're just here to get the information. They want to do a good job. It's not like we're engaged in intellectual fisticuffs. I don't know why I said fisticuffs, but like, it's it's not a battle. It's just a discussion. And at the end of it, we're all going to turn off a Zoom. <laughs> we're going to turn off a Zoom and do something else. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Now, how has your life changed since you've left academia and now that you're working this job? I want to hear whatever you have to share about just quality of life, you know, mentally, where are you? What's, what's it like for you now? 
Yeah. So you mentioned anxiety. I am a, my baseline is to be anxious at all times. I try mm -hmm. not to be, but it just is who I am. Unfortunately, from a variety of experiences uh, through childhood that I've talked about with my therapist, but mm -hmm. I have anxiety. It just is a part of who I am. Mm -hmm. I am, I would say, less anxious now on the day to day, uh, especially through weekends than I used to be as a graduate student. If I was conscious, I was reading something. So the aforementioned, if someone would mention something that I didn't know, some scholar, some idea, something, mm -hmm. I would write that down on a little notebook. I kept like a hipster journal, but I, I don't have any in here. I used to have like a field notes journal. Mm -hmm. I would write that down. And then so after I did all my graduate student stuff, I would read additional stuff. I worked all of the time because I felt I came from a not great educational background in Kentucky. We have not great education. And I had to, I always felt behind and I always wanted to like get up to speed. So I always felt behind and always felt anxious as a result. Um, when I was on the tenure track clock, I was always, I would wake up very frequently in the middle of the night, worried that I had missed a class that I had enrolled in uh, online and forgot about. I have that dream still, but I was constantly waking up being like, oh my God, did I get published? I would wake up literally being like, did I publish that thing? Um, and I remember thinking, boy, that's not su super healthy for my well-being to like think nothing uh, except for, am I going to get tenure in five years or am I going to get tenure in four years? What do I, what am I going to do if I don't get tenure? Yeah. Um, now I am still anxious, baseline, always anxious. I am currently very anxious about uh, like the changes in the economy on the macroeconomic level, big changes. And then specifically within the world of tech, there are tons of layoffs, as you'd mentioned, there's tons and tons of layoffs. It's hard not to be um, anxious. And so my internal monologue to myself is, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. That's usually the internal monologue about being concerned about layoffs. Yeah. And then the thing I have to tell myself is, if I were in academia, it's not typical that you would get laid off. However, with the change, uh, with like the enrollment crisis that's happening and cha like changes in society, um, a lot of smaller institutions, like the ones I taught at, are closing. Not state size generally, but like I taught at a religious private institution. I'm not religious, but I taught at a religious private institution in Detroit with a very, fairly small enrollment. And like, if you look at the long-term trajectory, like the trajectory of enrollment at that size institution, it's not a great trend. So if I had stayed at that job, there is a likelihood that that program that I was in, which was small, could have been cut, and therefore I would have been laid off effectively. The university could close down. I've had several friends who've lost jobs because of a program being just cut or um, the, the university closing. So it's not on, it could have happened in that other role. But mm -hmm. if I had lost that job, there would have been no jobs to jump to next. Like if I lost my tenure track communication studies uh, assistant professor role, and I went back on the market, there weren't that many jobs. Yeah. And if there were jobs, they were more than likely not tenure track full time. The salaries wouldn't have been great. And I would have had to physically uproot my whole, my partner and I's life and our dog and move to that physical location. Yeah. That would have sucked in a variety of ways. Now I'm anxious about layoffs. I'm anxious about the changing climate, but I do know that there are other jobs that I could do in the field that I'm in as well as adjacent fields and then fields that are totally outside of this space. Um, so I try to <laughs> assuage my, or I don't know, I try to mitigate my anxiety at all times by just realizing like, if this, if I get laid off or if something terrible happens, or if I need to pivot again, I have survived worse. I have survived a variety of things. I will eventually uh, figure something out, but there are at least opportunities. Whereas the other side of things, if I had lost my job in academia, there weren't a lot of opportunities. Yeah, I would have been immediately sort of thrust into a non-academic career path, but I wouldn't have thought about it ahead of time and like prepared for it. It would have just been like, good luck. You have been thrown into this new space. Try to survive. Yeah. Um, so still anxious. I would say that my mental health is a lot better because of that lower anxiety with the exception of layoff tech changes. Mm -hmm. um, the, the subtle, very important thing of like having weekends I, the first weekend when I started working in my new role, I had a really difficult time. I remember asking Victoria, like, what should I do? <laughs> and she was like, well, we could go watch a movie or like we could play a video game. We could do whatever. I was like, okay. But like, 
what what after that should i like um should i like make a video or something for like a lecture just like no like you, you could just do nothing you could just sit on the couch for like two hours and just relax yeah i had a really hard time um adjusting to that now that i've acclimated to having a weekend or having time off or taking days off and not feeling guilty about it um that has really improved my life dramatically because i feel like i can go for a walk and take a break or i can like last weekend i took a few days off to go get my back tattooed and that was a thing that as either a graduate student or a tenure track role I would have probably felt guilty about it, even though it was a few hours of my day, I probably would have made myself feel bad wow. for doing that as opposed to like, I'm alive once I am X amount of years old. I've only got X amount of time ahead of me. I work for the money that I earn. Why shouldn't I have the ability to just like do nothing or yeah. do whatever I want? So that's helped like yeah. super tremendously been helpful. Um, Overall, I'm, I'm a lot happier. That's good. I'm happy to hear that. And I will say anyone that has a dual PhD, you can survive anything. OK, <laughs> so no matter what's down the pipeline, you've done the hard thing. It's just a matter of pivoting. That's, now, that's, the, that's the thing I was going to say. If I can. Uh, I wish someone had told me the sentence that you just said, uh, mm -hmm. like anyone who's earned a PhD, you may not be the most intelligent person in the world. I think people from the outside looking in are like, you have to be the smartest person in the world. I don't know if you've experienced this, but people will be like, you're good at trivia, right? Because you had an education of this. Oh I'm terrible at it. I don't know anything about 18th century French history. Mm -hmm. And, but like, if you endured a PhD, you endured it. You can probably do something in some other field pretty well, because just the amount of like dealing with, uh, frustration and bureaucracy and like headache and organization, you can do a lot of different things. So if you can endure a PhD or a master's or even a bachelor's degree, any of those degrees, if you can endure it, you, there's a lot you can accomplish and you should like take time to realize that you've, you've done some stuff that's really hard to do. Not everybody can do those things. You, why wouldn't that also transpose to other sectors of existence? Like you, you can do stuff. So like be nice to yourself. Be nice to yourself. With the time we have left, what's a piece of advice you would give to someone who's contemplating making that leap? They could be a current graduate student or maybe even a recent graduate. Uh, get on LinkedIn. As an undergrad, grad student, I was not on LinkedIn or any of the kind of like career social spaces. I have a love-hate relationship with LinkedIn. Like it's cool to get to meet people, but it's also a lot of like weird posturing and like, presenting yourself like everything's great or that you're like in command of everything you know exactly what you're doing all the time or mm -hmm. people kind of trying to monetize everything yeah but you can make some relationships and like build up your network and so I, I would get on there the other thing is I would talk to people who are further along in their pivot than you are um, I would give yourself grace and I don't know it's I don't know just be open to trying a bunch of different things because if you were in academia and you've been fed the, the dream of you will become this one job, which is a professor or nothing else, you should do the inverse of that, which is you've got an education and training and skills and abilities. You have a whole bunch of stuff that's available to you. You should be very comfortable to try something that's different and then just be like, all right, I did that. Um, I am going to take those skills and selfishly, I'm going to use them in the next context, uh, to do something entirely different and I'm going to make more money or I'm going to live where I want. So like, just be very open to trying new things, try LinkedIn, uh, do all that professional stuff you got to do, but just like give yourself grace while you do it. That's what awesome. I would say. Well, thank you so much to Dr. Matthew Hale. User experience design research at iRobot. We've learned so much today from just all of his experience and his insight. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We will have more episodes coming. All right, y'all. Have a great rest of your day.